Thank you. And what Brian said is correct. My name is indeed Andrei Vladimirov, and I indeed work at Colfax. I'm presenting on behalf of Intel, and uh, let me explain why that is. Uh, Colfax is Intel's partner in developer training for their line of uh, Intel Xeon Pi coprocessors and the technology that will supersede it, nice lending. Um, Intel asked me to do this presentation uh, because they want to invite everybody participating in this event in a, a, a training, and Intel will sponsor it. In other words, it, it will be free for you. Um, uh, my goal for this talk is to give you enough technical information about uh, Xeon Phi and about the training so that you can decide whether this is something you're interested in or not. And I will do it by demonstrating case studies on uh, applications for Xeon Phi coprocessors that, that we did at Colfax. Um, I will show um, animated visualizations for them. Hopefully, the visualizations will work. And I think it's a perfect match. You're, you're just back from lunch. Hopefully, you still have snacks. I have the movies. And it, it should go well. Uh, let me uh, start by quickly introducing the uh, technology. Intel Xeon Phi coprocessors are computing accelerators. Uh, they uh, come in the PCI Express endpoint device form factor. And they can deliver up to one teraflop uh, per second in double precision. This is the theoretical peak performance. Um, these are computing accelerators, but they will not accelerate everything. They will accelerate only highly parallel applications with vectorization that also have uh, good uh, streamlined memory traffic. Uh, in a system, a Xeon Phi coprocessor might look like that. It can be uh, a part of a workstation. So you can have one, two, three coprocessors with their own fans, and <laughs> then you have um, uh, workstation level acceleration. Or you can put them in a server. Uh, this is a 4U server, and you see eight blue stripes in the back. These are eight Xeon Phi coprocessors. So everything I've said about Xeon Phi so far sounds very much like uh, it could be a GPU. But there is a very uh, clear distinction between uh, GPUs and Xeon Phi in the architecture and, as a consequence, in the programmability. The the, 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 that comes from the similarity of Xeon Phi architecture and the CPU architecture. A uh, CPU, a modern Haswell processor, uh, may have anything up to 18 cores per socket uh, uh, at a high clock speeds, something like 3 gigahertz. A Xeon Phi also has multiple cores, but it may have up to 60 cores at a lower clock speed. Uh, Xeon cores are smart. They are out of order. They have hyper-threading. Xeon Phi cores are more simplistic. Um, they are in order, and they have four hardware threads instead of hyper threads. Uh, another difference is that the CPU has access to the system memory, which can be huge. Xeon Phi does not have access to that memory, but it has access to its own onboard high bandwidth memory, which can be up to 16 gigabytes in size. And another similarity is that if you want to get anywhere with arithmetic performance, then on the CPU you have to use uh, vectors. The same uh, holds true about Xeon Phi. Uh, you have to use vectors. They have their own instruction set called IMCI, and the vectors are twice as long as on the CPU. Because of these architectural similarities, there is a very strong um, feature supported by Xeon Phi. They can run applications compiled from exactly the same source code as the CPU. And languages that are supported are C, C++, and Fortran. And if you talk about parallelism, then the same workhorse uh, frameworks are supported, OpenMP and MPI. Another consequence of the similarity between Xeon Phi and the CPU is uh, that it runs an operating system. There is an operating system running on the host, and there is an operating system running on each Xeon Phi. And this operating system is simply Linux. And uh, what, what it means to the developer can be illustrated here. Uh, this is a listing of a console session. I'm here on my workstation. I query my PCI Express bus, and I see that I have uh, two coprocessors installed. I also have this service running called MPSS. It stands for Many Core Platform Software Stack. This is the driver for Xeon Pi. So Xeon Pi has a driver much like a GPU. But things start to become interesting when I look into my host file. In my host file, I have two special hosts, Mic0 and Mic1 and they have IP addresses. And these are IP addresses of microprocessors. So I can talk to microprocessors over the TCP IP stack. And I can also build uh, services on top of that stack. 
such as distributed file systems or SSH, secure shell authentication. So what, what happens when I try to log in into this host mic zero? It actually lets me in. Now I'm on mic zero, so I'm inside the operating system that's running on my coprocessor. And in that operating system, I find myself in Linux. I can query my CPU, it has 240 cores. I can query my file system. It has all the usual Linux things, uh, including home. And inside of home, there's directories for user accounts and all that. So Xeon Pi really looks like a computer inside of a computer. It looks like a com compute node. And you can actually configure your cluster in such a way that Xeon Pi's appear as compute nodes. This is tremendously important for um, applications that you cannot afford to rewrite from scratch. And this is how it works. Because I have two, um, two ways to employ Xeon Phi through a driver and through the operating system, there are two ways to program it. One way is similar to what you would do for a GPU. You run your application on the host system, on the CPU. At some point, you have an instruction in the code that tells the compiler to compile everything inside the scope of this pragma for Xeon Phi. At runtime, when I reach this pragma, the code will tell the driver, driver, take this code, copy it across the PCI Express bus to the coprocessor, copy some data to the coprocessor, run it there, and then return the results. Unlike uh, a GPU, though, I can do some compiler and runtime magic, and this pragma will disappear. So the code that was supposed to run on the coprocessor will seamlessly run on the CPU. Another way to use Xeon Phi is the native mode. This is uh, distinct from a GPU because in this case, my whole application runs on the coprocessor. The host only boots the system, it boots the coprocessors, but then it does nothing when the application is running. This is the basis for MPI applications. And this is great because when you already have an MPI application, you have all the data traffic configured. All you have to do is to recompile this application for Xeon Phi and change your machine file so uh, ranks go to Xeon Phi coprocessor. And of course, the, it sounds easy and there ha has to be a catch. Well, uh, the question is, will it run efficiently? And I will show you case studies that have a definitive answer to this question. And the definitive answer is, it depends. <laughs> of course, you have to optimize for the Xeon Phi architecture. You have to massage your code and use compiler-friendly practices. You have to use vectorization in an efficient way. You have to use multi-threading. You have to streamline your memory access. And you have to uh, control communication. Luckily, what works for Xeon Phi also works for the Xeon. So the optimization methods that Xeon Phi applications required are the same as optimization methods that the CPU requires. And uh, let me get to the case studies to demonstrate how, what a tremendous effect it might have. Uh, this continuity, uh, what works for Xeon Phi, what works for Xeon also works for Xeon, for Xeon Phi. This continuity is a sign of a trend. And people who develop the next generation of the many core architecture agree with it. The trend is what works for Xeon Phi will also work for the next generation architecture. So the next generation architecture has been announced. It's codenamed Knight's Landing. Uh, it will deliver three times the performance of the current generation. And a feature that really excites people is that Knight's Landing will be available as a standalone processor. So no more PCI Express bus, no more coprocessors. It will be a system based on a processor with the, the many integrated core architecture. Um, I still think that uh, coprocessor, uh, coprocessors have value in uh, performance to cost and performance to um, power ratio. But still, th this is a pretty attractive uh, model. You just replace your system, your application runs fast, if it is well optimized. And the way to judge whether it's well optimized for that architecture or not is to see what happens on the current architecture. So this is my statement, which uh, many people from Intel developing nice lending agree with. The best way to prepare applications for Knight's Landing is to optimize them for Intel Xeon Phi with the current architecture, Knight's Core. Let me demonstrate to you um, some of the case studies uh, which we used to confirm that trend. Uh, the first case study dates back to 2012. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is work that we did together with Troy Porter, uh, astrophysicist at Stanford. Troy has uh, a code that simulates light propagation in the galaxy. A part of this code is the calculation of the interaction between light and dust in the galaxy. 
And this was a perfect candidate for offload because the Monte Carlo code, we didn't want to port to Xeon 5. But the result of the Monte Carlo code is the light intensity in every voxel of the galaxy. So we just had to copy an array that contains the spectra in, every, in all voxels to Xeon Phi, compute the dust emissivity, and return the results. Uh, the result of the optimization is that an ambitious project that we were planning, that was supposed to take six years with unoptimized code, now that project takes two weeks. And you're looking at a visual illustration of the optimization. On the left is the original code before optimization. In the middle is the code after optimization still running on the CPU. And on the right, that, that fast streak was the code running with Xeon Pi. And this is actually an old plot with a more recent code that runs twice as fast. Something that we learned in this case is how optimizations for Xeon Pi translate to Xeon and vice versa. So you are looking at performance. Actually, this is the logarithmic scale. Performance relative to some baseline. The baseline is the code before we touched it, before optimization. And the x-axis is the optimization step. So we started here. Uh, this was the CPU performance. Then, as I promised, it was trivial to port to Xeon Phi, and it ran. But it run, ran miserably. It was almost an order of magnitude slower. And then as we started to optimize, uh, we improved the algorithm. We worried about uh, vectorization, multi-threading, memory access. Eventually, we, we got up here. So compare this to that. This is uh, a factor of 200 acceleration. Uh, and 200 is a really huge factor, isn't it? Uh, but it is not insane, because the code that we optimized was Xeon Phi. We could also take and run on the CPU. And that's what, where it got us. So the code on the CPU also went through a 100x optimization. So this is. Um, Relay, this really relates to the title of my talk, uh, Scientific Computing with Xeon Pi Coprocessors. Uh, this specific application that we worked with uh, computed the interaction between dust particles and light, so it had some physics models in it, physics data. It took a huge amount of effort to just implement it in such a way that it reproduces uh, prior art, so that it's bug-free. It, it is a huge effort to validate it, and it, it was really comforting to us that we can optimize incrementally rather than throw everything out and rewrite from scratch and go through the same process of validation. The nice side effect of that optimization is that even without a Xeon Phi, we, we got uh, tremendous performance benefits. Now, this was an offload story where the main code runs on the CPU and we offload a part of the calculation to Xeon Phi. But it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, as I mentioned, Xeon Phi also supports the native programming model. Uh, this is another case study, also dating back to 2012. Uh, th this is a toy model, a toy model of the n-body uh, simulation. Um, this is a rather prim primitive uh, algorithm where every particle interacts with every other particle. And when we run this algorithm on the CPU, this is something like the collision of two galaxies, we get around uh, well five steps per second. Um, with 40,000 particles. When you run this calculation on the Xeon Pi coprocessor, it runs four times as fast. And it was relatively simple to uh, uh, scale it across multiple coprocessors uh, because the algorithm is, is simple. This is not a usable uh, code for really massive calculations, because for a massive calculation, you would have to use a tree algorithm to reduce the computational uh, complexity of the code from n squared to n log n. But this is a proof of concept. And the concept is that you, we can use the same performance critical code on the Xeon Pi architecture and on the CPU architecture. We revisited this code uh, two years later and uh, uh, looked at what happens when we want to scale it across a cluster. If you are interested, you can go and download the uh, presentation with uh, uh, code snippets that illustrate that. But we turned it into a, an educational example. So you're looking at performance, more is better, uh, versus optimization step. And green is the CPU, blue is the Xeon Phi. And it shows how we start with uh, a code that uh, is not parallel, 
uh, we add multi-threading, we improve vectorization, do some uh, code massaging, and eventually improve memory access, and we get one and a half teraflop per second on Xeon Phi and half a teraflop per second on the CPU. Um, this is node-level optimization. We haven't scaled it yet. Now, when we scaled it across the cluster, we had two options. One option is we could run MPI on different compute nodes on the hosts, and then each host would offload parts of the calculation to the respective coprocessor. Another way is we could forget that we have Xeon Pi at all and write the application as if we are designing it for a CPU-based cluster. And when we run it, we put the MPI ranks directly on coprocessor. There is a, a magic in the software stack for Xeon Pi that allows Xeon Pi's in one machine to talk across the InfiniBand fabric to Xeon Pi's in other machines. It's virtualization of um, InfiniBand uh, called CCL, um, Coprocessor Communication Link. When we tried both methods, that's what we found. Uh, native is really great. We, we could take a code and run it on the CPU, and we had four uh, compute nodes, so with four CPUs, we scaled the code up to two teraflops per second. Each compute node had four Xeon files, so we took the same exact code, changed the machine file, it scaled to 20 teraflops per second, and it was exactly the same code, and you cannot tell that uh, the code is using Xeon Phi at all. Now, 20 teraflops per second is good, but if you look at the efficiency, it's only 76% efficient. And that, uh, that's explainable, because you only have four InfiniBand port, ports, and you put uh, 16 MPI communication endpoints on them. So in this case, offload actually allowed us to do a little better. Uh, uh, with offload, I have only four MPI communication endpoints. And Within each system, I use the entire PCI Express bus to move my data. So with the offload, uh, we were able to achieve 92% efficiency in this application. Uh, when, you, when I talk about clustering, uh, because Xeon Phi can be programmed in two ways, with offload and native, um, there are multiple ways to use them in clusters. And uh, in, in the n-body code, we achieved 25 teraflops per second with Xeon Phi, so we really didn't care to use the CPU. They would add 10% of performance, but they would give us a, a world of headache uh, with load balancing. So we just neglected the CPU. But sometimes the CPUs can provide a significant portion of um, the performance. In this case, heterogeneous clustering can be done in a really attractive way with Xeon Phi. Uh, here's an, an application that we designed to prove this concept. It performs uh, a financial market uh, calculation known as Asian option pricing. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, think of it as a Monte Carlo code that simulates diffusion with a drift. Uh, we, ran, we wrote an application in such a way that it knows nothing about Xeon Pi. It simply takes multiple random paths and distributes them across different compute nodes Within compute nodes, it distributes them across cores, and within cores, it dis distributes them across vector lanes. First, we ran this application on a cluster of CPUs, then we ran it on a cluster of coprocessors, and finally, we ran it on a heterogeneous cluster, a cluster that contains both CPUs and coprocessors. And there was no code modification between these steps. We only replaced the, um, the machine file. Uh, so this is the calculation running on the CPU cluster, and this plot is the um, visual uh, illustration of progress. Uh, this is actually the, the risk-free uh, uh, put price of the Asian option, and uh, as results come out, they are plotted. Now we change the machine file and run, run the same application on Xeon Pi, and uh, it runs faster. And uh, finally, the third set of calculations you will see will use the heterogeneous cluster. So this shows that without code modification, it's possible to use both the CPUs and coprocessors. Of course, this is a synthetic application. We wrote it in such a way that it is highly optimized from the start. And um, also, we wrote it in such a way that it knows nothing about Xeon Phi. And we claim that zero lines of code had to be modified to port it to Xeon Phi, but in reality, it was already written that way. 
The question is, what happens when you have real legacy applications? Uh, maybe some applications that have millions of lines that people simply cannot afford to port. Will they work and scale? As I said, the answer is it depends. It depends on how the, the applications are prepared from the beginning. But my last case study that I will show is an optimistic, uh, uh, optimistic pre prediction regarding that. By the way, all the papers that I'm showing, uh, uh, there are, they are available at research.cofaxinternational.com, and code is downloadable. So let me uh, get to my last case study that takes a legacy application and looks at what will happen to it on the Xeon Pico process. In this case, the application is a shallow water equation sol sol solver. This is a uh, computer computational fluid dynamics code. It was originally written in 1984, and it was written in Fortran 77. There was no more recent standard of Fortran. It was um, scaled across uh, a cluster with MPI. And in 2008, um, uh, and and the, the, authors, the author of uh, the code is Paul Schwarz-Trauber from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So that's 1984, Fortran 77. Then 2008, a uh, researcher named Clifford Addison from University of Liverpool took this code and uh, implemented, uh, instrumented uh, some checkpoint restarting, instrumented allocatable arrays. So formally, it was Fortran 90, uh, but uh, you still had all, all, the, all the legacy of Fortran 77, the fixed format, and uh, um, the, the structure of the code. Um, when he tried to run it across on one coprocessor, it was accelerated. When he tried to run it across a cluster, it didn't work so well. So we came in in 2014 and helped to scale it across the cluster. It, it took a few days. It resulted in one line of code modification, and that's what happens. This is the live performance on one CPU. And um, then we ran the code on a heterogeneous cluster containing uh, comprised of a CPU and two coprocessors, and we did get uh, acceleration. This is acceleration by 2.7x with two coprocessors. Uh, of course, the, the CPU that we used is uh, a 2014 CPU, one of the fastest on the planet. Uh, it's a total of total of uh, 28 cores uh, with the Haswell architecture. But it shows that out of the box, legacy applications that are well optimized can work well. With minor tweaks, they can also be scaled across a cluster. Um, and uh, it, was run, it was run on a workstation, but if you download the paper, you will also see the results for scaling this code across a real cluster with InfiniBand. And the timeline is 1984 through 2014. So these four case studies, I hope, convinced you that uh, the power of the Xeon Pi architecture is that whatever optimizations you do for the CPU translate to Xeon Pi. And it likely indicates that whatever you optimize, whatever optimizations you do for Xeon Pi will translate to the next architecture based on the night's landing um, um, chip. Uh, finally, I get back to the original point of my talk. Uh, as I mentioned, Intel uh, is willing to sponsor free trainings with Colfax for uh, attendees of, of this training, uh, of, of this event. If you would like a training uh, for yourself, then you will have to come to us. If you would like a training for your organization, then uh, we can come to you. Uh, this training is not new. This training consists of uh, the know-how that we collected through our case studies and through focused work. Uh, we started teaching it uh, exactly a year ago, and since then we've visited over 50 locations in the United States and in Canada. It is based on uh, an old original Colfax uh, training manual or book. Uh, we are preparing a second edition of it. And uh, it comes in four formats. There's a one-day training that's just lectures. There's a, a sequel to that, which is hands-on labs. And there's a four-day training, which is the most in-depth uh, 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 workshop that, that we have. Uh, if you want to start communicating about that, go to this page, zeonphi.com slash 
HPC AC 2015, there's a form, just leave your contact information and, and we'll reach out to you and, 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 and see what, see how we can help. I hope that was entertaining and if you want to see the movies again, we are right there in the exhibit hall in the corner, so please stop by. And thank you very much, I, I'll, I'll, happy, I'll happily answer any questions now or offline. Thanks.